Hey everyone, welcome back to the Art to Life podcast. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about something I've struggled um, so much with, but I've made a lot of progress with, and it's been a huge game changer for me, and it's consistency. Consistency in your art making. Uh, it's the number one thing that I think can make a difference. Showing up uh, regularly has all kinds of benefits, tons of benefits. But the first step in this is understanding that it's difficult, <laughs> that there's tremendous resistance to to making art, to, to doing this with any kind of consistency. And why is that? And, and how do we work around it? What are some ways that we can uh, make this easier and make create consistency to get improvement? So I'm just going to hit the sort of the lens at which I want to look at this today um, is a little different. Um, so I'm going to start with just kind of touching on like the obvious benefits of consistency. Um, and then I'm going to drive in, dive into two, two kind of areas that I think are critical in thinking about consistency. One is the place, <laughs> that art making place. And number two, the way we make the art, the process, the practice. And it's so it's a little different than just going over the benefits of consistency, which I probably are pretty obvious, but I'm going to hit them anyway. I want this to be in, you know, important, uh, you know, I want you to re sort of reacquaint yourself with this and realize that much progress can be made if you can grasp how, how to be more consistent. It's a huge game changer for your art and your life and everything. When we're consistent, the, our skills improve. It's, it's kind of crazy. You know, I teach a lot of workshops and people wonder if they're good or not, or if it relates to what they ate in the morning or on Wednesday, Tuesday and Wednesday, they were doing great, but then Thursday came around and clearly they're not in a good mood and it's not working. And so we, we have this idea that, that that it's a wild card, but in this art making and how sometimes we're consistent, sometimes we're better than others, but here's the general rule, which is really kind of assuring that the more we do something, generally the better we're going to get at it. And art's no different. It's so simple. I mean, we know this with cooking. We know this with learning to drive a car or a bicycle, but art is no, no different. So you just have to remember that, that, that if we can increase the amount of time we're doing this, the frequency of doing it, we're going to get better at it. And, and so that's really great. Consistency, doing the thing a little bit more often, increases our motivation because we see our progress. When it's measurable and we can see a difference, I mean, it could be something as simple as someone noticing your work and saying, wow, you know, just the last few weeks, I've seen this amazing progress. I mean, we know how great that feels, right? When we feel it or somebody else reflects it back to us, it just gets us so fired up to keep going. Because if I just achieve this, what's possible? That's what's sitting in, in nested in the idea of consistency is, is this huge possibility for ourselves. It helps us define our voice when we say what we're doing again and again and again and again. You know, when I, I've been working on a book for a number of years now, and I'm, I study this subject and I can talk about this so easily because it's at the tip of my tongue, because I've spent so much time thinking about the process of teaching, what it means to be an artist, what are the pitfalls, what are the challenges, how to get, help people get unstuck. I don't need any notes. I just know this. And this is how we want our art to be. We want to know it better. We want to be touching more often than not. The thing is, you know, what it is we're, we're chasing. And the more we visit it, the more uh, articulate we can become. 
in speaking about it, the more consistent we can become. And it defines and refines our voice. And that's everything. Everything's relying on that. How you can make connections to what you're doing. It deepens your inquiry. And it makes from the outside, it creates a more unique expression. It's more and more yours, the deeper you can go into it. The consistency creates, increases creativity. It, it across the board, the coming and going of this art making, if you go into it and enter into it, and it's kind of hard to get over it, and then the next day you do the same thing, it's going to be easier. So you have more energy to be more creative because the process of getting there is just, you have more energy for it. It's no longer so difficult if you're consistent. You've got created a habit out of this and you're just showing up. After a while, it doesn't take a lot of energy. So you have more energy left over for the things that are important for you to be making, which is your creativity. It takes a tremendous amount of energy, but if all the procrastination is bogging you down, you're exhausted before you even get there. So. So there's a huge, there's huge possibilities in, in becoming even 10% more consistent. So how, how do we increase this consistency? And these are the general, you know, this is the first things I thought of, you know, that are pretty, pretty obvious, but nonetheless, let's just touch upon them. And it, the first is make it a, make it a habit, make Make what you do, set up a regular time, several times a week at the same time so it can become habitual. So you don't have to think about it. You spend 20 minutes figuring it out ahead of time. When's the best time? You know, when am I most awake? What would fit into my schedule? And again, choosing when you do this and think about what this is. This is a creative time for you. It's playful. It's so different than the other things you do in your life. So stacking that, placing it, curating the spot that you do it in your week is as important as doing it because you're gonna be more consistent. You're gonna be more fired up. You'll be more refreshed from doing it. If, you know, after your French class, you get to go into a room and be completely free after concentrating so hard, whatever it is, whatever, you know, so think about when you do it, but plan it, make it a habit, set that up. The second thing is to uh, find the support to do this, find other people that do this, right? Other people that believe in what you're doing, who maybe, you know, getting a studio with where other people are doing this, where, you know, spending Friday night isn't considered you know, a waste of time if you're making art. You're not going out because you get to do this really cool thing as your art and other people, like-minded people, will support you in that. I cannot tell you how important it is to not try and do this as like a silo. You need support, you need others. And this is across the board, what we're doing in Art to Life is I'm part of a community. We're creating a community of thousands of people that are making this possible and helping each other do this. That's why we get the results we get. You don't do a workshop with one person. You don't get the results. You get a results for everybody when there's 30 people there because everyone's feeding off of everybody else. It's amazing what's possible when you put yourself in the right environment. And it has a lot to do with who you surround yourself. You know, um, It will lessen the self-doubt and, and the fear. Another hack here is, is just you got to take breaks. You have to go out and get inspired. You, you've got to be in that mindset and having spaciousness. Know that the trip to the museum is as important as the, or the, the music event or the hike, whatever the things are that light you up. Those are so, so important. They're the flip side. They're what make your practice possible and it will make you more consistent. It's not just about you can't do this art thing by just rolling up your sleeves and just like working hard all the time. This is about an optimization of you and feeling really buoyant and feeling more yourself and feeling fantastic. That's how we wanna feel going in 
to this art making thing, this, this practice, and that will allow you to be more consistent as well. And then the last one is, um, is just to recognize, unlike everything else in your life, in the world, that this, this, when you take risks, which is an important part of, of making art, you are going to fall down and you are gonna have failure. You, you have to embrace this risk, clearly, that's so critical. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But but it is not failure is a necessary part of the creative process of art making. And as soon as you understand that, almost welcome it, <laughs> the easier you will be less fearful of this and and you just accept that. You just got to get used to that. I know it's completely different than other areas. We don't want to fail on the driver's test. We don't want to fail, you know, but this is the learning and, and the willingness to take chances will undoubtedly, uh, it's not going to work out sometimes. It's just not going to work out. And so embrace that, embrace that failure as a natural part of the creative process. Pretty great, right? Like there's a lot of, of, of room in here for growth and possibility. But I want to take a few minutes now and dive into the two kind of components of it, where I see the nuts and bolts of this thing, where the challenges show up. And there's two places. One is in the studio, is the place you go. And I, when I say studio, I, it could be a kitchen table. It's the place you go to do your art, whatever, whatever that may look like. And the second one, which I'll get to in a minute, has to do with your actual practice. So let's dive in to the, the place. What goes on there? It's really important to reframe if you have resistance, which we all do, is remember to be able to reframe your art practice. This is the number one thing that I do that helps me when I'm tired. It helps me when I'm overwhelmed, when I don't feel like going, when I don't have a lot of energy, when I've been working really hard, right? My energy is low. The reframe is that that place is the place I get to be utterly, totally free. There's no constraints there. I have absolute freedom. I can be completely myself. There isn't any restrictions there at all. And if there is, if you go there thinking you have to make a certain kind of art, we have to revisit that, right? Like that's not right. Your place is, is yours alone. And, and I don't know how people live without a place like this. Maybe that's what the, you know, the man cave is or something. But this place, this art place is the center of you. And when you reframe it that way, that you get to do whatever you want, and this is where you go to practice being free. You get to go practice chasing what you desire. I mean, that's, that's amazing, right? That's so exciting. And it should feel like a vacation from your life. Even a little bit will get you there, you know, because it's like, I'm tired now. Yeah, but it's easier there than anywhere else, you know? I will come out of that feeling more fortified, more fired up, more energy. It will give me energy if I have freedom. Does that make sense? So, okay, so that's, that's probably the most important thing, the secret thing that I do uh, around my place that keeps me going, because I do a lot of stuff. I have a lot on my plate and I love it. I like doing this podcast. I could be at my studio right now, but I'm going to go to my studio, you know, like, so that's important. Now, the second piece of this, you have to kind of let go. And this maybe has more to do with your process, but the place is not where you go to make the thing. The place where you go is to be in a, in a state of mind, to be yourself to be free and the result of being that way <laughs> will make things 
there's an artifact of being your best version of yourself, and that's your art. And what's cool is if you are in a place, if that place does that for you, don't worry about your art. You'll keep making it. If I can get people, people that I teach, you know, students, mentors, you know, people that are like, I'm helping along the way, they will keep going. And if they keep going, because it's so friggin' great to do this, the art naturally gets better. Art is amazing breakthrough art is created because of the process you're in, you know, and this is, this is important. So that place wants to foster that. That place wants to be neutral. It's like Switzerland, you know, it's like, oh my God, I get to go to the studio. The place is where we practice our discernment, where you get good at, without outside influence, at choosing what it is you want. And that is such a worthwhile way to be. It's where you learn about your boundaries. It's where you learn about what's important to you. It's a reflection of you. You know, it's where you're going to reinforce who you are and who you're becoming. And the art will kind of take care of itself. We're sharpening our skills there. It's where we go quietly alone and stand in front of the thing we're making and learn, you know, like... It's so exciting, it's so cool. And, it, and we're the creator of the workshop and we're giving ourselves, the art gives us the place and the art and what we're doing there. Have you ever thought about it this way that it is exactly perfectly designed for you? You know, like we all take workshops. Like I, I teach workshops and I'm encouraging people to come and take it, but what is the perfect workshop? for you right now in your life. What you're learning in that place, you take out into your life, you take out into the world. It's what gives you potency. It's where you find your fire to do purposeful work in the world. I mean, why wouldn't you love that place? Why wouldn't you just like relish that? We want that place, by the way, to be a reflection of who we are. So we go there and we want to see things that remind of us as of who we are and who we're becoming. Like I'm looking behind me right now and those black lines on the wall back there, you can't really see it. This is in my house. Those are giant orange oars um, from a Coast Guard boat from the you know turn of the century in San Francisco Bay. And they're and I love water and those and that color that you can't see it, but they're like this amazing orange color and they're from the ocean and it's about moving through the water. All those things, when I see those, that connects me back to myself. And we do this. We gather things around ourselves that might not make like a lot of people aren't going to like, why would you put an oar on your, on your wall? But for me, it, it connects me back to myself. And the studio is, is a gathering place for all those bits and pieces. And I want you to think about what you bring in there because it is, it's, it's, there's a curation a little bit. You know, when I was a kid, I, I was close friends with my parents from England and I grew up in the Bay Area. And uh, we had another, that my parents had these two friends that their son I was, and I were really close, really close. We grew up together and we were both artists and we drew and we built models. His father in particular had a vision, had a dream of building an inn, an English inn, you know, like completely authentic. And he just talked about it all the time. This was a dream of his. And he used to build these models <laughs> In the, in the rooms, they always moved around. These, this, this family always moved. And it was always in the Bay Area. They were always moving. But the father um, was always building these models, beautiful models of inns. Like, you know, they're like storybook inns. And he would, he would paint them and he cut, would cut out little people and put glue them on the side of it. And they were like, they were so authentic looking. And he, he put moss on the chimneys and the, and the windows were like, old stained glass and 
just looked like it had been there for 300 years, you know, gorgeous, you know, and there were all these different variations. And he was always building these models and he was kind of, you know, my parents sort of joked about him. He was like this dreamer, you know, and, um, you know, I just watched this, my dad's, uh, my friend's father create all these models all the time. And he eventually, he did have a piece of property he bought out in Muir Beach, uh, which is out on the coast uh, on Highway 1. Uh, and for those of you, you know, who have been to California or are from this area, the Coastal Commission is insane in protecting these areas. It's pretty wild. And to get a permit to do anything, to build a house, I mean, there's there's a lot. You, there's a lot of environmental reviews, there's neighborhood reviews. And this community, this town is called Muir Beach. It's a little coastal community, small, you know, 300 homes, gorgeous little beach and all these um, birds. And uh, and I do a lot of runs out there. It's it's a fantastic place if you've ever been there. Muir Woods is is nearby, the old, old growth redwood trees. Anyway, um, he bought the land, he bought some land in this town, kind of in the, like, right along the side of the road. And he proposed to create a commercial establishment. No way, no how, the, no one in the community wanted this. They don't want to bring a Burger King to Muir Beach, you know. They didn't really believe him of what he wanted to create. They didn't really look at it, but he fought like crazy to create this inn. And, and you know, no way. <laughs> you know, my dad was like, he's, he's a nut, you know, and, but nonetheless, we would go out and it was years. He had this land for years and he would put stuff on it, but it was just a, a land, grass for, for many, many years. And he bought all these secondhand bricks because he wanted to build a wine cellar. And my dad's like, you know, this is a pipe dream. He's never going to do it. And every weekend I would go with this family and Mark and I, we couldn't drive, but we'd go along with the family and they would drive around uh, the, the wine country and we'd go to these estate sales. And his dad and his mom, would they would buy this stuff. They'd buy kind of like a lot of old um, model boats and plows and weird brass pots and stuff. And like, I remember once they bought this huge fireplace mantle, you know, and we had to tie it on the roof of the station wagon. We had the dogs in the station wagon and all this stuff. And we just, I never really thought much about it. I just thought they were, you know, crazy buying all this random stuff. And they, their house was like a pack rat thing. Anyway, long story short, through much travail, you know, hard work and and picket crossing picket lines, he builds this in. He pulls it off, you know. And Mark and I have grown up by now, but he pulls this off, and it is, it's gorgeous. This this inn is incredible, and everyone fought. The community fought him year after year after year. And I remember one dad time, his dad woke us up. In the middle of the night, he'd been drinking and he's like, you know, he's he was he was drunk, you know, and he was so angry and he was telling us to like never, you know, like never let your dream be taken away from you. Like never have that occur. And and you have to fight these people and blah, 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 you know. Anyway, this inn is so beautiful. It's called the Pelican Inn and it's in Muir Beach. And it was so crazy because, you know, it's a it's it's an inn and they've, they've got like this amazing beer and darts and there's nothing going on in Muir Beach at all. And all of a sudden there's this really cool place to hang out. I go every Tuesday, we have a run out there and we go in and have beers. And, and what's so cool is it's got this amazing fireplace and it's all candles. The whole place is lit with candles for dinner. And, and it's like you're in an old English inn and all the stuff that was collected on those field trips on the weekend in those station wagons, it's all in there. It all makes sense. This guy had a vision and he collected all the pieces that helped create the, the, the sort of momentum to make this thing a reality. And you go there and you look at all this and it's like, how, the, how was this created? So it was incredibly impacting, impactful for me to watch how he held his vision. If you go there and have dinner, it's an amazing experience, but there's this hearth, the hearth that we bought, this huge hearth, and had this gorgeous mantle, and it's giant. And the, the kind of fireplaces they have in England in these inns, 
they I forget what it's called. It's a but it's a it's a it's not just a it's not just a fireplace. There's an actual you can go into the fireplace and there's these little seats inside the fireplace that are like kind of hidden and you can sit in there and it's private and it's super warm. Um, and so they have that there. But on the mantle is written fear knocked at the door and faith answered <laughs> and nobody was there. And anyway, this experience changed my life and it really taught me a thing about collecting pieces of your vision and your studio and, and, and where you make this is where you can congregate this, where you can curate this, where you can be reminded of the thing you're after. Because the world isn't rooting for you necessarily. There's many things, many distractions. So this place is like a sanctuary. Framing it this way, <laughs> you know, can make a huge difference, right? And, and that has been a giant lifesaver for me. And because I go, I improve. And because I improve, more possibilities happen for my work. The next piece of this has to do, the sort of secondary component of consistency has to do with your practice and the process. Um, Stephen Pressfield's book, if you haven't read it, The uh, War of Art, uh, really, first of all, daylights the fact that we have resistance. If he says the first step to getting over this is acknowledging that we have resistance. And I think that's a great way to describe it. It's like resistance, like pushing a car or, or trying to push a skateboard with a broken wheel. You know, like it's hard <laughs> when there's a lot of resistance, but it's all about, you know, one of the main thrusts of the book is about embracing the process uh, to, to lessen this resistance. And I love the subject of process. And I've talked a lot about it on this, on this podcast because it's kind of a study of, a, a personal sort of study of mine. The idea that the great work, the breakthrough art that you're interested in creating is gonna come as a result of, of your practice and making it bulletproof, making it cool, making it like you can do it and you feel like yourself. In the Creative Visionary Program, our 12 week, uh, once a year kind of boot camp for artists, we talk a lot about this, about how to make work and feel more embodied, more playful, more like yourself, more creative. Because if we can get you feeling the way you wanna feel, then the art will feel like that. And when the art feels like you, it becomes more personal. It becomes more different than what else is being done out there. It becomes more authentic. And that is a major value creator in the world of art. So this place, you know, but then the process of, of what you're doing there is, is super powerful. So talking about this process a little bit, understanding that it is not so much being in there all the time and doing this all the time. That's not necessarily, right? You're gonna improve, but you're gonna improve not because of how long you're doing the thing, but because how many times you do the thing. It's, it's not about the duration, it's about frequency. And if your shoulders don't relax, like that is, that is scientifically proven that you improve quicker and faster and more efficiently by repeatedly doing something in shorter bursts, right? And it makes total sense because you go into it and you learn something and then you go out of it. And then you come back a short time later and you see what you've done and you learn on that thing. And then you go away and you do something and then you go away and you come back. It, there's a stacking that occurs of benefits of a visitation, absence, visitation, absence, visitation, absence. We think in, in our art making that if we're not in the studio all the time, there's so many distractions. There's so many things to do in the world. And it's like, I can never have enough time. I never can do it. And I'm just a loser because I just, you know, now I got to go do this. And now I got to do that. You guys, 
this is the best way to make art. All those interruptions can help, right? I mean, you have to get in there, but just know that if you get in there, even for 20 minutes, it is a million times better than not getting in there at all. And part of resistance is created by the story we're telling ourselves about the possibility for ourselves. I can't do this. It's not, it's not available for me. I'm, you know, like I, I don't have, I don't have three hours a day to make art. You know, like I have a, I've got to support these people or I have this, I got to look after my mom, whatever the things are. And then, so I postpone, I postpone, uh, I'll wait because not, right now in my life, I can't do this. And it's like, you can't not do this. If this is calling to you, I just want to encourage you to start this process because it's the doing of it that makes it all possible. Your practice is, is literally, is how you do your practice. Your practice is gonna make this all possible. The, the consistency of showing up, even for a short period of time, makes all kinds of things possible. The opportunities, the learning, but also just in a general vitality of like life, of life force, health. I mean, there's so many studies now that connect being creative to, to living more fully, to wellness, to longevity. There is a, a study, uh, it was called The Impact of Cultural Engagement and Leisure Activities on Health and Mortality Among Older Adults. It was done in 2011 uh, by the uh, researchers at the um, University College of London. And it says it followed 6,700 6, adults for a period of 14 years, and they track their engagement in uh, activities such as painting, drawing, and sculpture. And they they discovered that this that engagement uh, was associated in a 14% reduction in the risk of mortality over the course of the study. And, you know, it's like all these studies, like it's, you know, regardless of socioeconomic status and age and gender and all those things kind of come into it. But this is what the research is telling us now. I just interviewed on this podcast, I think it was um, episode 74, uh, the uh, Ivy Ross and Susan uh, Maximan, Your Brain on Art, the study of neuroaesthetics. And uh, it offers proof about how our brains and bodies transform when we participate in the arts, how it improves our health, our and our ability to like flourish as human beings. That's a that's a go listen to that podcast. It's in, it's incredible. So so just know that this is like an insurance policy. You know, your process is no longer just about making a thing. This is about living uh, living better, living more fully, living longer. You know. And, and being happier in the, in the process, right? Okay, so that's just really, really, uh, really important to sort of like get that that, that, that practice is, it's about self-optimization. You wanna think about the practice a little bit about the rigor. Um, I think everything I'm talking about, there's a lot of truth to it, but if you're just kind of phoning it in, None of the benefits really, you're not gonna get the work going so good. It's, you You need to have some risk involved. You need to be trying new things, right? There's a, there's a little bit of rigor in this. And just to know that, just to know that, that you're there and there's a bit of a seriousness. It's not just a like, I'm just gonna like not do a thing. Um, that the benefits come by pushing into territory you don't um, you don't know about. That there's a willingness to risk, to change, to and, and evolve. You know that provides the most benefits. That kind of practice, a little bit. One of the hacks I use, <laughs> you can try this. I don't know. This is what I do. Is I give myself time to just 
doink around, but I have a timer. It seems crazy to use it, but I'll set a watch. I, you know, I have a running watch and I'll set it. And when I set it, it's go time and I'm going for it. And I'm not going to pick up the phone. I'm not going to stop. It's going to go for an hour. An hour is a lot when you're so focused. And so I will just totally dial that in. And that really helps me. Like it allows me to take bigger risks. I'm just moving, you know, it's like, I'm not thinking so much. So that's sort of a, a way around that. Understand that what you're doing is it's wild card time. We don't know what our art's going to be. We're, it, there's huge uncertainty in it, but the way you do the work, how you show up, how you, the time of day you do it, uh, what you like to drink while you're working, the kind of music you listen to, there's all these variables that you get to dial in. And I want to encourage you to do that because we want to make this practice as automatic, take out those variables of the practice so then the variables can be left to what it is you're making. So that thing you're making can go any way it needs to go. Does that make sense? It's already a wild, crazy thing that you're doing something that you don't even have a plan of what it's gonna be like. That's a big thing to take on. Do it in a way that there's a consistency so you can learn it and then you can modify it over time. And that's what's so cool. That's why I love sharing ideas of, of practices and how people work because there's great ideas out there, you know? Um, and I've picked up so much from hearing about how people, how people work um, and what makes it possible. In my effort, I remember where I learned about consistency because I always hear this and I wasn't very consistent and I was struggling, frankly, in, in my art making. I wanted I wanted to take it to a new place and I didn't know how to do it. And I was doing a lot of work that was um, was sort of dictated to me on and I was in a situation where I had to kind of make the same kind of work all the time. So what I did is I, I decided that I would get up in the morning at five in the morning and from five to 6.30, I would just, I would just paint. I would just paint for no, no plan and I was, I didn't know what I was gonna do. And at the time this was terrifying to me uh, cause I always needed a plan. I needed people to have expectations of me. I didn't have the confidence to go at this alone. And so, but I, I gave, I set up this process for myself that it would be at this time, I'd do it three days a week and it would be this long and it's early in the morning. And, and, and I only painted, they were six inches by six inches, which was these small little squares and and though that was the that was the parameters that I set up and I and I would get up and I'd walk to my studio pretty half asleep, which I think was a good thing, by the way, I was I didn't plan it that way. But the fact that I was still kind of half dreaming and half awake um, just allowed me to slip into like a flow state more. I just started making things and it seemed ridiculous at first, like I would make something and I kind of liked it, but I why? You know, like, what is this thing I made? And they were sort of representational, kind of not, but they weren't like great. And there was no, I wasn't going to sell them or anything, you know, but then, but I kept going. And it's something to see when you can, I started to see these, I put three up on the wall and then I had four and five, and then I had 17 and 25. And I had to, I built this little shelf in the studio for all these little things. And I put them in order of, of when I was going to make them, of how I was making them. And people would come in and, and they became like, what, what is that? <laughs> like, oh my God, what's going on with this one? And what's that? And I'm like, I don't know. Well, I think this one, and I would start to gain insight about the earlier ones. Um, I would start to understand the earlier ones better because of the later ones. I don't know if that makes sense. There was, I was most uncertain about the thing I made that day, but that would give me clarity about something I had made a week or two earlier. And I, I started to have a conversation with these and I ended up like scanning them and it was sort of early days and emails and I would send out these images and start sharing them and I would send them out and it became a whole thing. And, and people would share them with other people and it wasn't, it wasn't a money thing, but people would sign up 
to get these. And it kind of spread and, and got a whole energy going. And then people would give me their interpretation and how these images would show up on people's desktops, on their computers. And they're like, I can't believe you just sent me this, this blue horse painting today because it's, it's my daughter is in surgery and I live in Australia and, and it's her dream to ride a horse. And I've been thinking about her all day. And I just, I cannot tell you, you know, like there was all this synchronicity that was swirling around this. And there was all this, all these opportunities that came as a result of this work. And I learned all this. And what's crazy is because of the growth that came out of this self-study, the perfect way for me to learn, I started teaching this process. And that became Art to Life. That's how Art to Life came to be. This is why we are painting on 12 inch square paintings at all my workshops. And that's why we're doing a series. And that's why we bring, we work on 12 pieces at the same time. You know, it's like, this is 30 years later, it is still happening, but it was from a study of a process that created tremendous possibilities for myself. And it ultimately, I think, has impacted thousands of people. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so consistency. It's, it's the secret to so much growth. And I hope that this is, you know, if there's one or two little tidbits you take away, that would be a total win for me. So listen, thank you so much for being here. I would love to hear, especially about your process, what works for you, where you get stuck. If you go to the Art to Life uh, website under podcasts, there's a little yellow tab on the right-hand side. You can click on it and you can record a question. I'd love to hear a question or a comment um, because I use those audios as I answer those questions and it really uh, creates a, a really cool dialogue for, the, for this podcast. You guys, thanks so much for being here. If you enjoyed this podcast, please um, let a friend know or uh, please write a review. That's a huge thing. I, I guess that's why this thing's uh, spreading because if you're leaving reviews, Apple or whoever spreads this says, hey, people are actually enjoying this and we want more people to experience it. So I just want, you know, the, the progress of this thing is really because of you and I just have so much gratitude for that. So thanks for that. And um, I will see you next week, right here, same time. Thanks again for being here. I so appreciate it. Okay, bye.